Hi, and welcome back to my channel. In this video, you have my next episode of Recent Reads. You may or may not be able to tell I'm a little stuffed up and congested. I might have to pause to cough. I'm not really necessarily in the mood to film a Recent Reads wrap up, but I have one, two, three, four, I have nine books to talk about. So I'm actually gonna be talking about them fairly quickly to get through them, get my thoughts down about them. I spent several hours this morning finally updating Storygraph and Goodreads. That took a while. I had a couple dozen books to update there. I've just been falling behind terribly on that. So I'm actually gonna start with the, yes, all of these are ARC copies that I read and I read all of them as audiobooks because they have long since come out, but I do not have physical copies of them. So let's start with Totally Psychic. And this was adorable. In this book, uh, Paloma is part of a family that is known for having psychic abilities, communing with the dead somehow. And they live in Miami. Her grandma was a famous like, television psychic and it's real. People believe it, you know you actually contact ghosts and etc. But then they have to move to California and she's really not happy about this and she has conflict with her mom because her mom does not like this aspect, does not like the whole talking to ghost things, thinks it's a negative influence on her daughter who has just recently come into her powers. And because she's new to it and she's separated from her grandma when she's trying to make friends, she goes against some of the basic rules that are set out that the family followed so that you don't have trouble. And obviously there are going to be consequences from that. And it just was an adorable read. It didn't break new ground, but it didn't need to either. I really enjoyed this. Next, we have another adorable read, which takes contemporary and adds a little bit of fantastical, only this is a bit superpower-ish. And that is Ellie Engel Saves Herself by Leah Johnson. Leah Johnson's debut novel is You Should See Me in a Crown. I have not read that, but after reading this, I kind of want to. Leah Johnson is an author who has gotten a lot of pushback against her books because of what they talk about, but it's not bad. It's just people being bigoted against people of color and uh, LGBTQ and obviously ridiculous. I'm not gonna go too in depth on that. In this, Ellie is a middle school student who has a best friend who she also has a crush on. And she's staying at her best friend's house and there's this massive earthquake. Now you would expect them to be living in California. No, they live somewhere in Indiana, Illinois, somewhere in the Midwest. And it's very unusual that there's this earthquake. And shortly thereafter, she discovers that if she touches something that's dead or recently dead, she can bring it back to life because it accidentally happens with her fish. And she has to deal with this new power and also figuring out, should she tell her friend? Should she, like, how is she going to deal with life as a middle schooler? And I will say that for a lot of these, I did read them fairly quickly. They're shorter. I read them on a higher speed. And I don't know whether it's because I'm a little bit sick that my brain is not picking up on as many details because I can't remember a lot of details about this book. I just remember that I enjoyed it and it makes me want to read Leah Johnson's other book. The same goes for the third of these books and that is We Still Belong by Christine Day. The main character in this book is of indigenous descent but so far separated from the tribe that she's not eligible for tribal membership but she still really highly values her indigenous heritage. And she writes this poem that gets published in the paper and she wants to, um, about uh, Indigenous Peoples Day and why that should be celebrated instead of Columbus Day. I firmly am on that side and it's still really annoying to see like things for my bank like, we'll be closed in honor of Columbus Day. You mean the guy who never actually set foot on our continent and thought he was in a completely different part of the world and also was a massive racist and misogynist. Okay, let's honor him. That tangent aside, she writes this poem and I think it's her history teacher or something has said that if they, or maybe it's ELA, but if they get something published in the school newspaper, they can present it to him 
and possibly get extra credit points. And she is waiting to hear from him that day after it gets published and he doesn't say anything. And so then she goes and she asks him and he said, well, basically you're not getting extra credit because you didn't present a claim and debate both sides of the story, which a lot of people will try to claim that you need to hear all of the sides and present all sides equally when marginalized people are going, no, you need to hear our stories because for centuries, nothing has been said and the other side of the story got all of the press time. So to equal things out, maybe you need to hear just our stories right now. And I'm going on a lot about that idea and that, that was sort of present throughout the story. But just like with Ellie Engel, I, I don't know whether it was just because of like brain fog or I wasn't feeling well or something. It, a lot of the details didn't stick in my head. I just remember appreciating the book and thinking it was solidly written, but I don't remember a lot of the details, which I find unfortunate. Towards the end of the week, I read Fatima Tate Takes the Cake and a lot, there are a lot of middle grade and young adult books that center the idea like the person's, the main character's passion is baking or, and they're competing in a baking contest or something like that. And that's the case with uh, Fatima Tate. But I think that the author here, whose name is escaping me at the moment, she balances it really well with a lot of other things going on. Fatima is from a fairly conservative Muslim family who follows a lot of traditional rules, but she has a best friend. I don't know whether or not the best friend is coded as Muslim or not because the best friend has a girlfriend. So I don't know about that part, but the best friend is very insightful and is very concerned for Fatima and this budding relationship that she has with a guy who's about four years older than her, who seems too good to be true. And in that case, it often turns out that they are too good to be true. And of course, that turns out to be the case with this guy. You have the weaving together of her passion for baking, her parents wanting her to go to college and get a steady, stable job, but also be a good Muslim wife. So a job that she's able to support her husband with, but not necessarily follow her passions. And then also this guy who is very well off, his parents have political ties and he seems too good to be true. Like everybody likes him, but certain things come out and her best friend is like, dude, he's not good news. You need to stop. And she actually gets mad at her best friend for following through with this. Then there's manipulation by this guy of certain things leading with her family that's sort of like coercing her into getting married to him. And she's a senior in high school. Well, she graduates over the course of this book. And I thought that the author did an excellent job balancing all of these different issues. And I thought it was just a phenomenal read. The last of the arcs that I read was Murder at a London Finishing School. I discovered when I was looking it up to see if there was an audiobook that it is book seven in a cozy mystery series. Oops. But the thing about those sorts of series is you don't necessarily need to read all of the previous books. And in this case, I know that there were times where they were referring back to cases that they solved previously, but there was no way that I was going to go back and read six of those books before getting to this one. I don't think I'll ever read any of the other books. This wasn't bad. In fact, it was quite enjoyable and amusing. And I might occasionally return to the cozy mystery genre. And this was very, it was 1920s ish, two middle aged best friends, um, women who are returning to the boarding school where they met. There's some things that are going on and there happens to be a murder there. And so they're initially hired to solve the, the thefts and the missing other things going on. And then they get brought into the murder case. And I thought it was just a fun romp. And I didn't figure out all of the details by the end, but I wasn't actively trying to figure out and it was enjoyable. So I think I will be trying to pick up more cozy mysteries because it was a fun read. And now we get to the physical books 
that I read, starting off with Squire at Night by Scott Chandler. I'm pretty sure I've read another book by him, but I don't remember what it is. This is adorable. This is very appropriate for younger, younger middle grade, older elementary. It's this adorable quasi satirical take on a fantastical dragon story with the underappreciated squire who's the knight gets all the glory but he's the one doing all the work and it's just adorable it didn't take me long to read at all and I enjoyed it so much then we come to one of the last of the YA books that I read for the SEASL project which I'll talk a little bit more about that aspect in the next video or maybe not the next one but the one after that and that is Every Single Live by Rachel Vincent. I thought that this one because the synopsis read very thrillery like it would be like other of the thriller type books that were chosen. Thankfully it was not. I thought that this was a fascinating look at how rumors and assumptions take root and grow and affect people's everyday lives. At the outset she has just broken up with her boyfriend because she thinks he's cheating on her. He won't show her these texts. And she goes to confront him or do something. And she'd been absent most of the day at school. She goes in to the locker room and I forget why, but when she goes into the locker room, there is a dead baby. And of course, all sorts of attention gets heaped onto the situation. And there are people who are like, oh, well, you must be the mother and no matter how many times she denies it there's all sorts of vitriol spat at her and this gets picked up on national news and so there's a bit of the the aspect of what actually happened to this baby who are this ba these this baby's parents what is going on is she an unreliable narrator i half expected that to be the twist thankfully it's not i would not have enjoyed this book if that had been the twist but the way that they look at this, because this family, there are three kids. I think she's the middle. So she has an older brother and a younger sister. The younger sister is eighth grade. The older brother is a senior and I think she's a junior. Their dad was a vet who came back seriously injured and because of that ended up addicted to opioid and passed away of an accidental overdose. But there's a lot going on a lot of rumors and things that weren't clear about that and he'd been in trouble as a kid and so everything is starting to pile on and get all twisted and convoluted and it just was a fascinating look at an exploration of what this does and how this changes family dynamics and then the twist at the end by a certain point I could predict who the mother of the baby was and when it was finally revealed, my God, that makes so much sense. And it was just done with compassion, with heart, and it just hooked me in. And I, I got a whole lot more enjoyment out of this than I thought I would. Then speaking of something unexpected, we have Worst Case Colin by Rebecca Caprara. This is one of the last middle grade books for SCASL. And I don't think I'm going to be able to finish before the battery goes off. This one hit me like a ton of bricks. It's written in poetry and Colin is dealing with the lingering loss of his mother two years before and his father's descent into um, the hoarding compulsive disorder and how their house is getting more and more packed and his father's trying to hold on to everything but not him and he's valuing the things over his own son. And there's so many times that the poems it's written in poet and verse there's just so many times that i just went oh and it just and it just packs such a punch i i hands down recommend this book okay i'm going to try to get this last one in the house at the edge of magic this is the cozy feel good middle grade read that i expected Howl's moving castle to be it's not deep it's not long-winded i loved it thought it was adorable absurd madcap fantastic there you go. There are the nine books that I read, only four of which do I have physically. Thanks so much for watching. I hope to see you in the next one.